Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, police prepare for a convoy of protesters headed for Parliament Hill. Small fringe minority of people who are on their way to Ottawa do not represent the views of Canadians. The Freedom Rally gains steam, picking up support and some concerning online rhetoric. Canada promises military help for Ukraine, but no weapons as the standoff at the border continues. A curious trend among kids with COVID, some are developing diabetes. It's a nerve wracking for sure. Is there a link? Anna Maria Tremonti, longtime CBC correspondent, opens up about a secret she kept for decades. He said, either you leave or I leave, or I'm gonna kill you. It's just a matter of time. Oh my God. Surviving an abusive marriage and why years later, she wants answers. This is The National. What started as a group of truck drivers angry over a cross-border vaccine mandate has gained momentum and gained ground. The convoy rolling across Canada and transforming into a broader movement taking aim at COVID restrictions, public health mandates and the federal government. Greeted by roadside supporters, the protest continued its push towards Ottawa today, moving across northern Ontario on the Trans-Canada Highway and with plans to take their message to Parliament Hill this weekend in large numbers. There are concerns about what could happen next. Travis Danraj has been digging into the convoy, the concerns about just who might show up and how Ottawa is bracing for its arrival. On the road, on a mission, truckers passed through Thunder Bay today with sights set on Ottawa. Supporters greeting them along the way again. We believe that the mandates, the blanket mandates, uh, go against our human rights. For the first time, the Prime Minister weighed in directly on the convoy, saying 90% of truckers are vaccinated. As for the protesters... Small fringe minority of people who are on their way to Ottawa or who are uh, holding unacceptable uh, views uh, that they're expressing do not represent the views of Canadians who have been there for each other. Ottawa police are taking the lead on security Saturday, saying in a virtual press conference they are preparing for thousands to descend on Parliament Hill. What started out as a single expression of demonstration through what was called a freedom convoy involving vehicles from across Canada um, over the last several days, and particularly in the last 24 hours, has changed substantially. There is increasing concern about violent online rhetoric supporting the convoy and that those with extreme views are planning on attending. Pat King is in the convoy and claims to be an organizer. He is known for his far-right views and using homophobic and racist language in the past. Other convoy leaders are now distancing themselves from King, but King is dismissing their concerns. 100% that it's had to be done due to the PR. It had to be done. It had to. So it is what it is. Anti-hate groups are concerned about what this weekend could bring. There have been enough people who've been posting messages um, you know, related to the idea that while well, Canada will have our, our January 6th event, um, the majority of the people involved in this protest probably want nothing to do with that. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh said in a statement the convoy is dangerous. This after CBC News confirmed his brother-in-law donated $13,000 to the cause. The NDP says it was a mistake and he's now trying to get the money back. In an op-ed just published, Aaron O'Toole says he supports truckers but denounced extremists, urging Canadians to respect each other's right to protest. And Travis, Ottawa police will be getting some assistance in security for this event. That's right, Ian. It is unclear at this point how many protesters will actually show up here in Ottawa this weekend or how long they will stay, but police say they will be ready. The RCMP Ottawa Police and Parliamentary Protective Service, they're setting up a joint operations centre to monitor that main protest and also any possible counter demonstrations that could pop up. The other thing I want to note here is on the fundraising effort. It has grown in the past 24 hours by almost $2 million, now sits at $5.7 million. Ian? All right, Travis, thank you. Those opposed to the vaccine mandate for truckers say it will affect supply chains already under strain. 
Supply chain issues are helping drive inflation to its highest level in more than 30 years. One way to slow inflation is to raise interest rates. And as Jacqueline Hansen explains, the Bank of Canada is warning that could happen soon. This is uh, my condo. Like so many Canadians, Adrian Howell has both a mortgage and a line of credit. I'm just concerned that if interest rates go up too fast, too quickly, then it's going to be harder to uh, service all that debt. The Bank of Canada made it clear today higher interest rates are likely coming soon. We're signaling to Canadians that they can expect a rising path for interest rates. Because now it says the risk has shifted from COVID cooling off the economy to inflation getting too hot. Interest rates need to increase to control inflation. The central bank still largely blames global factors for inflation, from supply chain disruptions to weather events. It expects those to ease later this year, but demand pressures could build in Canada too. The economy is going to continue to grow and demand is going to continue to increase. That is going to create an environment for domestic inflationary pressures to grow. If Canadians expect prices to keep going up long term, that could also fuel inflation further. And that's when you get into that vicious inflationary cycle where people spend and spend because they don't want it to be more you know, expensive in the future. House prices have also soared over the course of the pandemic. Low interest rates are one factor behind it, but also supply is at a record low. We are having a housing shortage. This mortgage broker says higher rates won't help with that, but she still expects budgets to get squeezed. But the first quarter point may not feel it, but trust me, after the second one, you will start to feel that pinch coming. Howell wants to avoid feeling that pinch. I have a little bit more time to sort of do some comparison shopping, but I'm definitely going to lock my rate in. The Bank of Canada's next interest rate decision is just five weeks away. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Today, Canada announced what more it will do to help Ukraine stand up to Russia, and it falls short of what Ukraine says it needs. On a day when Russia put more military muscle into motion, David Cochran shows us Canada's offer and Ukraine's response. The Prime Minister and his cabinet met to consider Ukraine's request for weapons, training and sanctions, choosing to meet just some of those needs. I've authorized the Canadian Armed Forces to deploy 60 personnel within days to join the approximately 200 women and men already on the ground. That number could grow to 400 as part of Operation Unifier, an ongoing mission to train Ukrainian troops that will now be extended for three more years. This is not a combat mission, this is a training mission. A boosted training mission, support to deal with cyber attacks and military equipment such as body armor and surveillance technology, but not the weapons Ukraine requested. We know that the solution uh, to this tension must be diplomatic, not military. Canada has always been the strongest ally of Ukraine until today. Conservatives blast the lack of weapons or any lethal equipment as Russia masses troops and tanks along the Ukraine border. This was a half measure by Justin Trudeau, which will surely disappoint uh, our Ukrainian uh, allies. What the conservatives call a half measure Russia calls provocation. Additional uh, military support to uh, Ukraine is uh, only fuels the war in Donbass and serves as a source of, t of tension, not only uh, within Ukraine, but also between Russia and Canada and the West in general. The Ukrainian embassy issued a statement saying we welcome the cabinet's decision announced today to support Ukraine's defense, calling the measures extremely important, but adding that polls show 75 percent of Canadians are in favor of providing weapons to Ukraine. What's also missing in this announcement are sanctions against Russia, as Ukraine had also requested. Canada didn't deliver on that, but is threatening to coordinate sanctions with its allies if Russia takes any further aggressive actions. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Canada is not sending weapons, but Ukraine did receive more arms today, and Russia showed off some of its own combat hardware. That was the backdrop as diplomats performed their own maneuvers. Susan Ormiston now with the state of talks to avert war. Diplomacy by darkness. The U.S. ambassador in Moscow delivering a critical diplomatic pouch to the Russian foreign ministry. 
answers to the Kremlin's demands, a next step in the escalating crisis. Right now, the uh, document is with them and the ball is in their court. No one is betting exclusively on a diplomatic breakthrough, especially with Russia muscling up its military maneuvers. Releasing video today of new fighter jets en route to Belarus for exercises, it says. Warships, 20 of them in the Black Sea just off Crimea, carrying out communication drills. Whether they choose the path of diplomacy and dialogue, whether they decide to renew aggression against Ukraine, we're prepared either way. And Blinken said the U.S. and its European allies are in lockstep in their response. There's no daylight among the United States and our allies and partners. But the key Russian demand to bar Ukraine from NATO membership, still not negotiable. NATO sent its own response to Moscow today. There is no secret that we are far apart and that uh, there are uh, some serious differences between NATO uh, and uh, Russia. Which leaves but, uh, a diplomatic time, solution fragile. Russian rhetoric has been um, extraordinarily belligerent. It's not clear to me that the Russians really have a way of getting down the extremely tall flagpole that they have climbed up on um, without ac military action. While Russia crafts its reaction, Ukraine takes delivery of more U.S. military assistance to bolster its defense. In another development, Russian and Ukrainian envoys agreed to recommit to a ceasefire in a divided part of eastern Ukraine and meet again in two weeks. But the big question is what will President Putin do next? Will he respond publicly? The U.S. isn't waiting, considering now whether to send more troops to countries surrounding Ukraine even before an invasion. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. Rescue teams are searching the waters off Florida. 38 people are missing after a suspected human trafficking operation hit rough seas three days ago. It is dire. Every moment that passes, um, it becomes much more dire that, and, and unlikely that anyone could survive in those conditions. A commercial mariner came upon one survivor clinging to the capsized boat 70 kilometers off the coast. A body has been recovered. That survivor said no one was wearing life jackets. Four people have been found dead inside a home in the Vancouver suburb of Richmond. But as Susanna De Silva explains, tonight police say they still haven't figured out exactly what happened. The police tape remains along with questions about what happened inside this multi-unit home. I was standing outside here with my friends and then uh, suddenly police cars came with sirens and beams. Police say they were called Tuesday night around 8, but some in the neighborhood say they heard a sign of trouble the night before. Later I asked the daughter of my neighbor what happened and she said uh, there was a loud bang the previous night that sounded like a gunshot. Police say they found the bodies of four people shot to death inside a suite, that the crime had happened almost 24 hours earlier, but no one had called police. The RCMP still have not identified the victims, but believe they all knew each other and that there does not appear to be a risk to the public. And the information at scene indicates that this was a targeted shooting and not connected to any ongoing lower mainline conflict, we believe, at this time. Neighbors say a family lives within the unit. The local school district says none of its students were involved. Neighbors are unnerved by the lack of information. It's a little weird to, that it's happened uh, just like two doors down, but yeah. I don't know. We've so far felt safe here. Yeah. RCMP are asking anyone that saw anything unusual the night of January 24th to call them. Susanna the Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. To PEI now, where schools will reopen on Monday for in-person learning. There'll be enhanced health measures, including masks for indoor areas and increased testing. Even before classes resume, all students and staff are being asked to take two COVID tests 48 hours apart. Now, without testing and tracking, many Canadian parents are left wondering about case counts in schools. Some provinces have turned to data on absence rates. As Deanna Sumanag Johnson explains, as unsettling as that may be for some parents, it could be the future for monitoring school outbreaks. Learning that British Columbia will no longer track COVID cases in schools made Stuart Eng and his wife more confident in their decision to keep their six-year-old at home. 
basically saying like, hey, we're not going to do any more testing of children and we're not going to give you any more notices. It basically just sealed the deal of we, you know, the government just basically just gave up. In the absence of PCR tests, BC has moved on to another method of gauging which schools have cases. If staff and student absence is more than 10% above the usual rate, public health will investigate. In Ontario, a 30% absence rate will trigger the same call and a notice to parents. But absence tracking does have flaws. It does not distinguish between a child who's homesick and those who are kept home by their parents or away on holiday. Still, this infectious diseases specialist says it is useful for public health. If you ask people in public health what they look at, they look at trends. And they can look at trends at a school level, at a regional level. But if you're seeing a trend, um, then no matter what the absolute number is, it tells you something is changing and that you need to look at it. Some school boards are finding their own way of refining the absence data. Here at the Upper Grand District School Board, they have their own website that tracks only absences for illness. So far, the response has been positive because we think we've been able to provide the type of information that everyone is looking for, and that is an approximation to the number of uh, people who are away, whether they're students or staff, that would be COVID-related. Meanwhile, Stuart Eng is doing his own research on a crowdsourced school COVID tracker so he can try and assess when it feels safe to send his daughter back. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. There is another COVID issue affecting school age kids, diabetes. Doctors have been seeing an increase in cases during the pandemic. And as Vic Adopi explains, researchers are looking to find if they're connected. Ava Lund Phuket is back to full form. Last month, she endured major weight loss and an unquenchable thirst. Classic symptoms pointing to untreated type 1 diabetes. It's a nerve wracking for sure, uh, and it creates some, somewhat some anxiety. For good reason, left untreated, it can lead to ketoacidosis, a dangerous condition children's hospitals are seeing more of. We have seen more ICU admissions. And the risk, though, of the diabetic ketoacidosis is that um, there can develop brain swelling and, and in very rare cases, death. The increase in type 1 cases in Ottawa over the past year is only anecdotal, but it's being seen elsewhere. This children's diabetes clinic serves all of San Diego County. We did, in fact, notice to our surprise that there was indeed a much higher rate of, of, of type 1 diabetes in kids. New research from San Diego shows just how high. Compared to previous years, last year saw a 57% increase of new cases of type 1 diabetes. In most cases, the kids tested negative for COVID-19, so the study's author says it's too soon to draw any conclusions. We really need to see what's happening in the rest of the U.S., what's happening in Canada, what's happening in other countries, and really see if this trend um, is consistent. Like many autoimmune diseases, the causes of type 1 diabetes are unknown. There is often a family history, and illnesses from other infections can sometimes trigger diabetes, but that has yet to be proven with the coronavirus. Prior to most diagnoses of diabetes, a child will have had uh, an infection, which just kind of tips them over the edge. It doesn't cause them to have diabetes. They would have presented at some point. If there is shown to be a pandemic link, Scientists are hopeful that when COVID-19 cases come down, so too will type 1 diabetes diagnoses. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. CBC journalist Anna Maria Tremonti has been telling other people's stories for decades. Now she's telling her own harrowing tale. And then he started pummeling me with his fists on my back. And I didn't know what was happening. Coming up, the former longtime host of The Current reveals the abuse she hid for years. Plus, Team Canada is on its way to Beijing, but it's been a bumpy ride to the tarmac. It's been a lot of precautions for us. And Ottawa plans to honor actor Ryan Reynolds for all his good deeds. We can change our world, but we have to fight together. We're back in two. Welcome back. That flooding last fall in BC's Fraser Valley killed hundreds of thousands of farm animals. 
That's disturbing enough to deal with. But now getting rid of the carcasses has stirred up outrage. Brady Strachan shows us what's upset some people. Wow. This is getting a little bit hotter. 85 degrees C. Under these massive tarps, organic material is slowly decomposing. We use Gore-Tex jackets to compost organic waste into a Class A compost. This composting facility mainly handles food scraps, but last month the BC government asked it to take a different product. 17 truckloads of pig carcasses from a farm devastated by the catastrophic flooding in the Fraser Valley. It was a disaster and they were in standing water on the farm polluting the water. The 10,000 diseased hogs were mixed with wood shavings and covered with tarps, but not before someone took photos of the carcass pile, which ended up in local media, along with criticism from the Upper Similkameen Indian Band. And it said that uh, we were uh, leaching and polluting into the river. Um, yeah, that was horrible. <laughs> so it's just not true. The First Nation did not return calls or emails from CBC News. The province says it inspected the facility and will release its report in the coming weeks. Along with the hogs, an estimated 650,000 animals died in the flooding. The vast majority were poultry, but also 12,000 pigs and 420 cattle. In this situation, it was a little more difficult because the animals had maybe been deceased in a field or something along those lines, and we couldn't get to them right away. This Vancouver-based rendering company was able to process 125 tons of hogs into oils and proteins to be used in pet food and animal feed. In situations like this, um, it just, uh, it, it's, it's just a heightened reality for us to be able to, to go in and uh, make sure that we uh, help as much as we possibly can. The birds were sent for composting. Only the cattle could not be processed. They were sent to a landfill. Back in the Similkameen, it will take one year for the hogs to compost. That material will be used on farmers' fields to grow food next spring. Brady Strachan, CBC News, near Princeton, B.C. Next on The National, CBC journalist Anna Maria Tremonti opens up about the secret she hid for years. They can't know that you're a battered wife because they won't hire you. A deeply personal account of an abusive marriage and how she's trying to get answers today. What if he says, well, yeah, but it was your fault? Anna Maria Tremonti tells her story next. Welcome back. Tonight, a familiar face with a story you might not be expecting. Deeply personal and distressingly common. Anna Marie Tremonti is certainly a well-known journalist, a CBC News foreign correspondent for many years, then for nearly two decades, the host of CBC Radio's The Current. But this very public Canadian kept one chapter secret. She'd been the victim of intimate partner violence. Now she's doing what she's always done, using storytelling to get to the heart of things, now in a new podcast. And tonight, in a raw and detailed interview with Adrian. Ah, really good to see you. Good to see you. Does it feel funny being in here? A little bit, yeah. I, um, I feel like I've known you forever. And to realize how much of a big piece of the story of you I was missing is brutal. Do you have a shorthand to describe what it is that happened to you? When I was 23 years old, I married a man who beat me. And I'm one of the lucky ones. I got out of that marriage within a year by my first anniversary. But what he left me with was not physical injury. It was the, what, it was the emotional and psychological pain that I took with me out of that marriage and kept with me for many, many years. But if you didn't know that about me, that's because I didn't want you to know, right? And that was part of it. There was a shame that has kind of trailed along after me, depending on what was going on in my life. We can all hide things. And when I'm in broadcast mode, this voice of mine has hidden my greatest secret. My name is Anna Maria Tremonti, and this is my story. When you started this podcast, there was no ending to this story. What did you want to happen? I really wanted to tell my story, though, to also kind of signal that this can happen to people who you don't think it can happen to. This can happen to people who you think are strong, 
And in fact, victims of intimate partner abuse mm -hmm. are strong from day one because they get up in the morning and they keep yep. living. And we don't realize, we don't give them credit for being as strong. We think they're weak, they're not. So can you tell us a story? You, as you say, married very young, 23. I look at myself now and I look at that picture of my elopement day and I think, what were you thinking? Hmm. It was a whirlwind. He was very sort of out there, very outgoing, spontaneous, fun-loving guy, but he would be moody. And the first time it happened, he'd been moody and I didn't understand why and I was trying to figure it out, like ask him. And I was trying to get him to talk to me and he just blew. And he threw a pot of coffee at me. It wasn't that hot, but it, like that coffee hit me on my back because I turned. And then he started pummeling me with his fists on my back. And I didn't know what was happening. This had never happened to me before. I didn't understand it. I didn't know what to do. I kind of like hunched over. Mm -hmm. I probably asked him to stop. I don't even remember. But he just kept hitting me and hitting me. And when it ended, I remember going into the washroom and I could already see bruise marks. I could already see the marks on my back. And I remember thinking, wow, you bruised so easily. Like I really wasn't registering yet what he had done. And of course I don't bruise easily. I bruise when you hit me hard. <laughs> Did you wonder if other people knew? There was um, a Sunday that was particularly hard. It had started early afternoon. He was angry with me. He was punching me, yelling. I no doubt yelled back, but there was a lot of um, there was a lot of hitting and punching and there was a knock on the door and there were two policemen there. Mm. And they wanted to come in. I wouldn't let them in. They told me, and they probably shouldn't have, they told me that my neighbor downstairs called them. And they wanted to come in. They kept saying, can we come in? Uh, you know, where is your husband? And I'd say, he's sleeping upstairs. And, well, are you okay? I'm fine but I want them to go away. And I'm not happy that they're there. I thought that bitch downstairs. But that was the day. That was the day that somebody knew my secret. And what did that day change? Not a thing, Adrian, mm -hmm. not a thing. It is as if he has taken whatever's inside of me and ripped it away. I have never felt such emptiness, such untethered unbeing. I look down and look up again and still see nothing, no one. It is a moment of non-existence. So at some point you left. W what happened? W what was the decider there? I didn't decide I had to go. He did. Mm. We had been in Ottawa and um, he had beaten me up. And then he left me there. He said, I'm going home. We had driven from Fredericton and he left me there. I decided I was going to take the train home and it was an overnight train. And I spent my time on that train saying, this has got to stop. I'm going to be a better wife. And I remember getting in to the house early in the morning. It was like between seven and eight. And he said hello to me. And I poured myself a coffee and I sat down from across from him a little closer than this. And he said, either you leave or I leave or I'm going to kill you. It's just a matter of time. Oh my God. <laughs> what do you do in that moment? I didn't know if I believed him. Hmm. I didn't know if he was capable of it. Because you didn't want to believe him or... I was so far down a rabbit hole. It was days later that I had a job interview with CBC. And you know, Fredericton's a small place for <laughs> reporters. <laughs> and by this time, I'm in a guest house and I've got my stuff, but I gotta get dressed for this interview. And I've got fingerprints oh my on God. my neck. So I got to figure out what to wear. 
They well, can't know that you're a battered wife but because why? they won't hire you. They wouldn't hire you because you were a victim? Well, that's what I thought. Yeah. You know, they you know, that because to be a victim is to be blamed, right? So you get the job. I got the job. This is a city already devastated by war. You have the most extraordinary career. All these years later, did you bring this experience with you as well? Yes, I brought it with me, but I didn't let it overtake me. I mean, I look at my deep connection to the war in Bosnia. Hmm. I just always wanted to go back in, like send me back, send me back. But I think that I found something important in finding people who are in the midst of a trauma that is not of their making, that is not their fault, that they do not have control over, they're stuck in. Another displaced victim in a war which exacts its greatest toll on civilians. Were you also looking for someone who understood you? Were, were you looking to share this a bit and be less lonely in this experience? I think I was trying to, you know, it's a good way to put it, the loneliness of trauma. I think I was trying to help, I don't think I was trying to help myself. In the end, I was helping myself. Um, but I wasn't worried about my loneliness and trauma. Mm -hmm. Again, I felt that that was separate because you think you're alone. And I diminished my trauma because that trauma was much more acute, let's face it. I've spent my career confronting people with power, getting them to account for their actions. It's what I do. So of course I've got these questions and they're not going away. And that 23-year-old in me who got sideswiped, she wants some answers. I, I'm not going to give away what happens, but I do find it interesting that you really worked hard to go through accountability. Like you intended to talk to him, right? You wanted answers, and you went at it like, like Anna Maria Tremonti. Well, on a very intuitive journalistic level, you gotta hear from the person you're talking mm -hmm. about. I have wanted to not confront, but to have a conversation with him for a long time. And I've not known how to do it. And then the question is, well, what if he denies it? Hmm. What if he tells you you made it up? What if he says, this is how I remember and it's different. What if he says, well, yeah, but it was your fault. And navigating that is a lot. And it is a lot for a lot of victims. And a lot of victims don't even get to the point where they get to navigate it. And I do. And all these years later, what do you think of that bitch downstairs? I'm grateful for her. I never knew her name. Thank you for having the guts to open up about this. It's going to make a difference for a lot of people who will not see this coming. Thank you. Thank you. You can follow Anna Maria's new podcast, Welcome to Paradise, on the CBC Listen app or wherever you get your podcasts. The first two episodes will be available February the 15th. Many people have experienced the abuse that Anna Maria endured, so what can you do? Coming up, how to have the difficult conversations with someone you suspect is facing abuse. And a little later in the show. We say goodbye to a veteran who touched our hearts. Stay with us. Welcome back. We want to continue the conversation now about intimate partner violence. It is a private matter, but there are some details that we do know, much of it from federal government data. Although both men and women do experience it, about 80% of the victims are women. A reported one in 10 Canadian women fears violence in the home. And on average, it takes seven attempts before those who attempt to leave do so successfully. And as the pandemic continues, that picture grows more dire. Toronto lawyer Deepa Mattu is the executive director of the Barbara Schleifer Commemorative Clinic, which supports victims of intimate partner violence. Deepa, welcome to the program. Thank you. What's changed in terms of violence during this pandemic? I think what changed um, 
in the experience of violence during pandemic was that uh, people living on the margins were all further marginalized and uh, survivors of violence and women uh, living in the houses with their perpetrators were put on further lockdown and there were restrictions for the right reasons created, which meant that they were now in the confined uh, spaces uh, uh, which is a perfect storm for breeding violence because you have a situation of lack of income security, you have situation of uncertainty, uh, lack of connection with your loved ones and your family um, or the service providers, and that um, further intensified the situation of violence and the high risk situations uh, and lethality has seen a rise along with the numbers, of course. And And speaking of the numbers, you've said that we all likely know someone who's experiencing some kind of abuse. So, so what sort of things should, should friends and loved ones be, be looking for? I think one of the most important factor for the loved ones um, and friends, and, and uh, absolutely I, I do say that each one of us probably knows someone uh, who's navigating it as we speak. Um, uh, it is important to be a, a good listener. It is important to make sure that if you are seeing that they are um, they are being isolated from you. There are restrictions being put on them to be uh, remaining connected with you or your friends. Um, you're finding that their decisions are not being made by them, uh, that you be, um, be watchful, be there to listen to their experience, be non-judgmental. I think that's the most important thing uh, to remember. Um, always keeping their safety in mind, but not necessarily putting your judgment on their experience is really important because uh, as we say in our uh, work at the clinic, the survivors are the experts of the situation that they're navigating. And sometimes they know way more than you would ever understand. So therefore, it's really important to um, let them be in the driver's seat of making decision, but make sure that uh, you are there for them and providing uh, when needed resources to them. We have just half a minute, but I mean, what's the advice? What advice do we give somebody in that situation? I think the most important advice to give is that uh, you're not alone. There are people on the margins who are all further marginalized and uh, survivors of violence and women uh, living in the houses with their will be planning for them because we know that when abusers lose their control, uh, the escalation of abuse is at its peak. And mm -hmm. therefore, it's really important that if someone is, is planning to exit, that exit strategy is done with the help of a professional. All right. Deepa, thank you very much. Thank you. There is no national hotline for people experiencing intimate partner violence, but here's how you can get some help. Head to sheltersafe.ca and click on any part of the map for the resources nearest you. Next on the national team, Canada sets off for Beijing. We're going to have fun, so we're really excited. The hoops they jump through to get to this point, plus... So I'm not going to be the good guy. Thanks, guy. I'm going to be the great guy. Ottawa rewards actor Ryan Reynolds for doing good. Stay with us. Spotify is pulling all of Neil Young's music off its streaming platform. This week, the Canadian rocker said he wanted his songs removed if Spotify refused to part ways with podcaster Joe Rogan. Young accused Rogan of spreading misinformation about vaccines. Rogan has an exclusive deal with Spotify, and his podcast reaches about 11 million people an episode. Well, the wait is almost over amid the pandemic uncertainty and upheaval. The Winter Olympics begin next week. For athletes, it's time to set off for Beijing. Renee Filipponi caught up with some members of Team Canada at the Vancouver airport as they take on what has already been a challenging competition. After years of training and weeks of COVID tests, Team Canada is on its way to Beijing. For these Olympic medal-winning sisters, these games are like none other. The road was not easy, but I mean, we're really grateful to be able to go to the, this Olympic and we're going to have fun. So we're really excited. For the rookie on the Moguls team, it feels surreal. I don't think it's hit me yet. And I think that this is the goal that I've been waiting for for so long. And, and now it's here. So I'm just going to enjoy every moment of it. It's been a road full of stress and sacrifice to stay healthy and avoid COVID. 
This coach went to big lengths between international qualifiers. Even when I come home, I don't go to my house. I have young kids that are in school. And so it's, yeah, it, it's been a lot of precautions for us. Team Canada was given its own check-in counter. And once through security, their gate was cordoned off from the public. To keep athletes safe, the Canadian Olympic Committee has chartered this flight to ensure social distancing. N95 masks will be worn and everyone on that plane will have had an additional COVID test today. The athletes waiting to board en route to fulfilling their Olympic dreams want to focus on the sport. This isn't a surprise. These athletes have been through this for the last two years and they're willing to take those precautions because these are the Olympic Games and this is where they want to shine. But before they take off, there is a blessing from two elders from the Musqueam First Nation. We said prayers while we were doing it, blessing and hoping that they get there safely, back home safely, and that they do really good in their games. Just the start of a long journey. Many on this plane hope will end on the podium. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Richmond. As we get closer to the Olympics, stay with CBC for all the action from Beijing. Get ready for the sights and sounds of the world's best athletes going for gold. CBC is the official broadcaster of the Olympic Winter Games and we'll be bringing you all the drama from the ski hill to the skating rink, plus the challenges of holding a global event during a pandemic. Adrian will be hosting the national from Beijing in the days leading up to the opening ceremony and will lead our coverage throughout the game. And Adrian and Andrew will host special coverage of the opening ceremony on February 4th alongside Scott Russell from CBC Sports. It all starts at 6.30 a.m. Eastern. A sad update on a man you've met here on the National. Canadian veteran Fred Arsenault has died just shy of his 102nd birthday. I never had a, such a big birthday. We first met Fred two years ago because of his modest request. 100 birthday cards for his 100th birthday. He got them all right, and then some. It's gone across the world, right? We're getting calls from everywhere, right? Cards from all over the world. More than 100,000, and they were still coming a year later when we checked in with him again. The impact going beyond his birthday. It reminded every Canadian, every veteran, uh, how important they are in society and, and how we embrace them. Letters from home gave him comfort on the battlegrounds of Europe. In his later years, it was the words on birthday cards from around the world. Up next, the Hollywood superstar who could soon be lighting up a street in our nation's capital. And yes, I occasionally tweet from Ottawa Public Health. Why? Everybody does. Ottawa's special recognition for a hometown hero. He has won countless awards, even recently recognized by the Governor General. But now Ryan Reynolds may become a fixture in Ottawa, or at least his name may be. The Canadian star appears to be in line to get a street named after him as thanks for his contributions to the city. And that's our moment. You know Ryan Reynolds for his blockbuster hits and maybe for his small acts of kindness in his home country. From helping donate warm winter coats in the north. There is something else I can do. To reminding Canadians to stay safe. Something we all can do. During the pandemic. Reynolds, a local superhero, especially in Ottawa, where the Vancouver-born actor spent part of his childhood. It lives up to the hype. Plus, plus. Time and again, he's donated to charities in the city, including the food bank. I'm not going to be the good guy. I'm going to be the great guy. In recognition, he may soon be getting a street named after him, the mayor says, Ryan Reynolds Way. When we broached this idea with Ryan, he said, quote, very excited, flattered and honored here. I'm even a little choked up. This means the world to me. On Twitter, he thanked the mayor for an incredible honor, saying in response, he's changed his daughter's name to Ottawa. 
Okay, so if he goes through with that, changing his daughter's name because Ottawa, if they go ahead and name a street after him, he's got two other kids, so maybe Penetanguishene and Tadamagouche might name a street after him just to see if he continues the trend. By the way, it's interesting to see how different places in Canada lay claim to him. So Vancouver, for example, where he was born. The local supermarket where I go to, this is my brush with Ryan Reynolds' fame, is where he used to stock shelves. I am so proud. That is the National for January 26th. Good night.